that we've been talking a lot about chronic homelessness, and she thought it would be a good idea to bring that here and for you to hear sort of some voices from people who are working with folks who are chronically homeless in different capacities. And so that's what today's panel is. Um, let me start with um, the definition that we use around chronic homelessness, um, which is a very interesting and unusual one. It would not have been one I had made up, but it's the federal concept of chronic homelessness, which means that a person has been literally homeless, which means they've been living in a place that um, is not meant for human habitation, and that they've been homeless for a year or more, or they've had four episodes of homelessness in a three-year period. And then the third condition is they have to have a disability. Um, and it's a disability that's recognized under ADA standards, like it could be a mental illness, it could be a substance abuse issue, a physical disability, a developmental disability, and that range of um, issues. So anyway, it, it's a topic that um, I think is uh, relevant as we walk down the streets of our community, <coughs> driving around, and we see people who are really struggling, and they're out there, and they need safety. And so I think this group, we have some really wonderful organizers and um, advocates on this panel, and I'm just going to quickly let them <coughs> say what their name is and where it is that they work. I just want to just say a little bit about the organization, just a teeny bit, and we'll run through the trails. Eric, you want to start? Sure. Uh, Eric DeBerg, Community Supported Shelters. We design and build Conestoga huts, and we run three uh, rest stops on Eugene City property. I'm uh, Daniel Dickens. I work for St. Vincent de Paul in the Vet Lift program, which does permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless and also teams with the VA to do grant per diem housing. And I work for the SSVF program, Supportive Services for Veteran Families, that provides money for rapid rehousing and homeless prevention. I'm Cheryl Stone. I'm the court administrator for the Eugene Municipal Court. The Eugene Municipal Court um, handles most misdemeanors in this um, and um, I've done quite a bit of research on access to justice for displaced um, individuals and um, in other communities. And I just want to add, um, Cheryl contacted us when we were working on the one night homeless count because she wanted to help count people that were homeless that she was going to and we really appreciated her reaching out to us for that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Dana Peterson. I work with Shelter Care Shankle Program, and we provide uh, residential services as well as uh, mental health and ho other housing services to individuals. And my name is Sean Murphy and I'm with the Lowville Center and we are a community mental health program that works with individuals who have been diagnosed with a serious mental illness and part of our mission is to help people ensure that they have safe housing and employment and are able to I'm Cindy Lemming. I work with the Head Dash program with the Veterans Administration. And that program works very closely with the Housing Authority. We have Section 8 vouchers, and we the uh, social workers with that program do the case management for those veterans. <coughs> our target is chronically homeless veterans. About 65% of our um, population is, has been chronically homeless. Okay, so you see we have a pretty sharp group here. I want to point to your packet for a second, just highlight a few things. Um, I want to thank Amanda and Lisa who are on our staff. And they put together some pretty interesting data um, from page 17 to 19. And it, it shows you the programming that we currently provide. We, we do know that there are huge gaps in the community. That's very clear to everybody who's sitting here. But we also know that we are doing some work and we're providing some housing to people that are chronically homeless and we're doing a good job <coughs> with those folks. And what you'll see in pages 17 through 19 is all the programs that are providing help. and I'll, just do a, such a quick summary so that the panel can talk. <laughs> say that if you looked at this and you poured through it, you'd see that we have 91 households that are chronic, have chronically homeless individuals in it who are in permanent supportive housing, and we have another 62 households that got into rapid rehousing programs or traditional housing programs. So, like right now, as we speak, there are 153 households that would have been living on the streets who are dealing with a lot of issues that are in programs that are um, safe and secure for them. So I want to take that for a moment and acknowledge that we're doing some really good work here. And in those pages, when you look through your packets, um, it names the programs that are helping them and the kind of work that they're doing. And these folks are all involved in that. Okay, so what, we, what I'm going to do is, and I'm going to sit down and let these people talk. We, um, 
Sean was great. <laughs> she like, I left for vacation. <laughs> I just got back. But she came up with some questions that she thought would be helpful for the panel, and then I shaved them and changed them a little bit. And um, but she did all the work, so thank you for that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna I'm gonna like do the question, and then I want you all to jump in and just like jump in where you want. I'm not gonna call on each of you and torture you, but we want to hear from everyone at some point. Those are the rules, okay? So the first question for the panel is. For people who are chronically homeless, what would you identify as the challenges that they face and the strengths that they bring as they move into housing? That's actually something that um, I speak a lot to. So um, we work real closely pre-housing with our veterans, and one of the things is that, um, homelessness, especially chronic homelessness, is a culture. And you have to understand that culture. Part of that culture is a, a, a process of barter where you might trade each other for protection or you might trade each other for you know, any kind of resources. Well, when one of those people get into housing, they are still part of that barter system. And one of their ways of paying back is to allow people to come in and shower in their apartment or come in and have a meal with them or spend the night. And it becomes a barrier to their housing because then they get um, problems with trafficking and neighbors complain that you've got all these people coming in and out of their apartments. So that's one of the things that we work with really closely with our veterans is um, helping them to understand that this is their safe place, that they can make barter trades outside of their home, but that they need to keep their home as their safe place where they have privacy. I would say you start with the strengths, I guess, of that um, each person has a story that I think is worth hearing. And, and it may be the story that you don't um, anticipate or expect. Um, and, and it's worth hearing um, for a number of reasons. One, I think that, it, that um, hearing people's stories helps validate them, helps you find solutions, um, maybe, to services that they need to be connected to. But it also helps us understand how people um, initially end up in a place of chronic homelessness and that and and to really try and prevent that on the front end instead of react to it um, on the back end I think that that, that is this, um, probably the largest strength that I can think of um, that they bring. I, I think that um, some challenges that they face are um, connection to entitlement, not just health care entitlements but ID and um, other types of maybe um, disability incomes or other types of things. Maybe I've, um, in places that I've volunteered, I've seen vets who somehow lost, moved, and then didn't have their benefit check coming to them anymore and didn't know how or where or didn't have the means to get to where they needed to go to make that connection again. And um, uh, there's a man in the community where I live where that was the case. And at a stand-up event, he was able to get connected. I know he shops in my local grocery store, which is kind of cool because I get to Get to see him and he's housed and, and doing well. So I think um, in a connection to entitlements. But the other big challenge that I see, um, at, particularly at court with people that we've tried to help, is um, readily accessible services. It, it, it's difficult for me to call some place for housing or for any other types of service and say, well, you got to have them here on a Tuesday or a Thursday between 3 and 5. And I'm like, that's you can imagine how hard that is to facilitate, especially if there's mental illness involved. Um, and so I, I think that's probably a really large challenge that I see. Yeah, there's a, a lot of fear of the unknown, too. I've worked with people that have been at the mission for 10 years. That's the life they know. I'm used to living with 200 other people, um, and now you're asking me to go into a house by myself. Well, I don't know. I don't know that I can adapt. So you really have to work with them to get over this. That It's, it's okay to move forward. This is... Positive, and they don't always see that. Mm -hmm. You have to give them a very good say that for the people that we work with is that they're really knowledgeable about community resources. I thought my staff had a lot of knowledge. But sometimes when people come in, they can tell us exactly. I mean, they know they you know have a tremendous skill in, in, in the situation that they're living in of how to get their needs met. I think is a huge strength. And, um, also, that a lot of people are survivors, um, 
they were surviving usually something that happened that contributed to them being homeless. And when they're homeless, things happen to them often that are pretty traumatic and I would say, wow, I don't know if, you know, if I could do that. Um, and that uh, I see that as their strength. And, um, and a lot of people, once you sit and listen to them, they're very forthright about what they see is what they want. And so I think for us and for my staff, part of that is that we've had to grow because we've always thought, well, everybody wants an apartment, right? I mean, but that's not everybody's dream or where they're, they're at right now. And so, um, but I think that's a strength that, you know, they'll tell us that's not what I want, that's not where I want to live. Um, and, uh, and that helps to create and work with people to move them forward because we're not pushing them somewhere. Um, I see uh, some of the challenges kind of like, you know, what Cindy said is that sometimes with the transition to uh, permanent housing, um, the skills that you have when you're homeless and living on the street don't translate. I think, like, you know, the, the property managers will say, being a good neighbor. Um, and so some of those things that, you know, some of those strengths and skills that um, help you to be safe and um, when you become a tenant can become you know, an issue. And I think it's, it's hard because you develop that support system sometime and then what we're asking is to let that go in order for you to have housing. So I think that can be a challenge for folks. Um, and that also, I came here, I just had somebody look at income, and the individuals that we work with on average earn $778 a month plus SNAP. And that's when they're housed. When you're homeless, Social Security will cut your income because you're not paying rent. And so that, that, that <coughs> is a challenge to try to save, even if you are ready for housing, to you know take care of your basic needs while you're being homeless, and then try to <coughs> save for you know, rent deposits, uh, all water, things, so that, that could be a real yeah. challenge. <coughs> Daily basis. Um, we're going to let the panel talk for now. We're going to take questions towards the end. Yeah. Nina, yeah, could you do a favor in about 10 minutes? Yeah. 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 We'll have a question and answer period. The clock continues to say 825, so I can't. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, let's take, it's been 8, 825 for a long time. Um, <coughs> what specific issues are I'll uh, speak to you. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I, I struggle with the question a little bit because of my own personal beliefs uh, and how and, and my and my lifestyle. Uh, I don't really subscribe to housing, even though I understand it's important and having shelter is important. Um, I haven't lived in a house um, for four years. We live behind our shop in a Conestoga hut where we build a Conestoga hut. We run our operation there. Um, the idea of pulling people from their community and saying you have to cut these people off now and live in a house, I think it's there's some uh, unrealistic um, standards there for people to just say, come be with, you know, in some ways it's saying, come be with us. We're the successful ones. And if you communicate that message, I think you can also damage and, and add additional trauma onto people. Um, and I, I really struggle just with the social that 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 perspective. That's not it's it's said, but it's not said straightforwardly. That there's something wrong with you. Let me help you. I've got it figured out. You don't. But what I've learned is with people, you know, people who live on the streets, they've they've accomplished quite a bit. You know, the people who are chronically homeless. The fact that they've survived for years and years is a success. But when you're when it's your job to go and, and get people housed, you know, all you're thinking about is, okay, get this person housed, you know, that means I'm doing my job well, that secures my stability. But I don't, I think that can also um, damage our whole community sense of stability. Uh, and just, just for the record, you know, our organization provides safe spots for people to be as they're transitioning into housing. We, we personally don't really I do what we call mild case management or just helping people be connected to services, but we're not 
working on getting people into housing. We kind of let them decide to some degree, you know, what, what it, their goals are. And for a lot of people it's housing, for some people it's just staying clean, for some people it's getting a job. Um, but we like to promote their independence and making their own decisions on what their success looks like. I want to piggyback on that, what you said. Because sometimes I think one of the challenges is that we as service providers sometimes think of things as like, what are challenges? Like you can't get an ID or you can't get this. But the reality is, and what I've experienced through when I work for McKenzie Transitions and now, is that trying to get people into housing is that landlord bias. If you show up somewhere with, you know, somebody who has long hair or wears the wrong clothes or has the wrong look about them, a landlord is going to look at them and maybe they'll just, they'll say, okay, we'll rent to you because you're working with Dana uh, or you're working with this agency. But then I've had 